the better you set it up, the better it's going to be. You will get the inevitable knocks. It's when things break or when you run out of something. The better you set it up so that people come and have a nice experience without needing to engage with you, the more likely you are to not hear from them. So it's answering every question you can think of before they actually get there. If you're a residential real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show's for you. Learn the secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field in order to guide you along your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so that you can turn your commissions into cash flow. I'm Randall DeCleared. Let's go, baby. All right, welcome back. Today, we're continuing our series of top producing agents from around the country, and we're joined by a special guest named Matt Thomas. Uh, He's coming on the show from Chicago. And so we dig into his brokerage side of the business like we have with other guests. We're talking about what he's doing to succeed right now, what his market looks like, and then some other strategies that he's using to invest and how he's building outside source of revenue. Not really an outside source, but an additional revenue stream within his brokerage side of the business. Very fascinating. So tune in for that because something that I'm sure other agents use and do, but it wasn't top of mind for me and the way that he has created this system. It seems like a type of program that you could replicate and earn some additional revenue in. So we jump into that. And then we also just talk about investments in general and how he has bought a few properties and what those look like and then his business in general. So a lot of high level information, you're going to get a lot out of it. Stay tuned to the end. And if you're getting a lot of value out of the show, I would really appreciate if you jump on and give us a like and review so that we can reach more listeners and reach more agents. If you have an agent or a friend that you think would benefit from this as well, by all means, refer them to the show. We'd really appreciate it. So let's jump into the episode and you guys enjoy. All right, Matt, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on today. Really excited to talk to you about where you are in the real estate space and what you're seeing in the market. So First and foremost, why don't you tell the listeners kind of where you are, where you're operating out of, and what you focus on mainly right now. Absolutely. My name is Matt Thomas. I'm a real estate agent with Baird & Warner Real Estate here in Chicago. And I service day-to-day buyers, sellers, investors, tenants in the Chicagoland area. But really, people I'm talking with are all over the United States in some way dealing with real estate. And that's pretty much where my brain lives 100% of the time. There you go. Yeah, perfect. So what asset class are you focusing on mainly? If you're talking to tenants, is it single family? Is it what are you doing? Chicago is an interesting city. So we really have most everything. I choose to focus on the residential side of real estate. The license is all encompassing. I like residential more. It's more personal. The assets that most people are investing on the residential front, you have single family, you have condo. We certainly have multifamily here in the city. And then we also have Tenants who are working creative leases, corporate leases, and things on all asset classes. So it tends to be a pretty complicated network, really, of types of assets, and it's all dependent on what your objectives are. Right. So do you do some of the commercial leasing? Like, is that part of it? Not too much, to be honest with you. I've done it before. I will help clients selectively if they need to go through that. I have clients who have started a business here and there, or maybe they need to find a storefront for their business or something of that nature. The commercial leasing world here in Chicago is truly, at this point, it's a crazy market to get into just because they're going through so many rapid adjustments as the city slowly comes back to life from COVID. I think that that's an interesting opportunity on its own. I leave it to the commercial leasing experts because the field that they're looking at right now is unparalleled to anything we've seen before. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is very involved. That's why I just didn't know if you were working on the residential and on that commercial leasing side. So amazing that that license lets you do, you can say, yes, I can do just about anything. Oh, for sure. I don't don't manage corporate leases day to day. Yeah. I had somebody reach out to me the other day and they were asking me about a property lease and it was on a commercial deal. And it's just like, look, yes, I can, but you're going to be better suited to go find somebody who does just that. And that's what they do. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Again, just want to clarify that with you. Didn't know. Okay. So you're in Chicago and what kind of like price point are you focused on typically? Yeah. My buyers really range anywhere on the low ends. We see sales around that 250 to 300. I would say for me, my average sale price is around four to 500,000. The high ends, my buyers or sellers are operating somewhere in that one to $2 million price point. We have inventory above $2 million in Chicago and Chicago lands. To be honest with you, it's few and far between. Our luxury yeah. market, if you will, kind of starts around that $1 million mark. Yeah. Okay. So we were talking a little bit a minute ago, and the whole premise of the show is to 
bring on, like right now I'm doing the series and I'm bringing on all these top producers like yourself from around the country. We're talking about strategies that you're using to grow your business, to win more business, things that if other agents implemented those things, they may be able to win more business as well. So is there something that you can point to that either sets you apart or wins you more business right now? Yeah, I think so. I think early on when I got into real estate, I realized there is a massive limitation that most realtors deal with, and that is the physical location that they operate and serve. You are bound to it. If you don't expand to a team, you are going to be stuck in it in your business. And it's limiting in a lot of ways. So my whole goal was in just developing any sort of passive income was how can I separate myself to the point where if I want to step out of my business day to day, I can. I have the leverage and the ability to do so, whether I continue to operate or not. And that's where the idea started. And then over time, what it's become has I leveraged multiple different ways for the income opportunities beyond what I'm doing day to day in real estate. The two that come to mind to me that have really been lucrative over the past 18 months. Number one, I don't shy away from referrals ever. You'll hear some agents who talk about referring business out or getting referrals in and they don't like paying the steep referral cuts that they get or whatever it might be. They don't want to pay back their money for whoever's handing it to them. I'll do a deal at a 50% split. I'll say it right now. Anybody in the country who wants to do a deal at a 50% split, call me. I'll help you get it done, right? Referrals are gold. And I have a network of people who I trust around the United States who I make referrals to if I have people going to those markets and I took time to develop those relationships. Or, and this is really the more important part of it, I've leveraged myself to the point where when I'm making content in the world, I encourage followers or anybody who just happens to come across that content to fill out an actual form and schedule time with me to set them up for a referral. So I'm taking control of the buyer process and saying, hey, rather than you calling whoever you Google in San Diego, talk with me for a half hour. We'll go through your objectives, just like I would with any first time buyer or buyer in your situation. And then I'll call the agents in San Diego and I'll vet them. I'll tell them what you're looking for. I'll make sure they're comfortable with the scenario and they're a good fit. And then I'll match you with them. So you take the job off the buyer's plate, you get a connection that is hopefully doing great business on the other end, and you become the mirror and the matching point for that. If you do it at scale, it's a great way to make passive income. You don't even need to negotiate 50% splits. You could do 20% and make good money in a year, right? So that's really been a process I've used to start and kickstart making passive income. And the second one, and then I'll shut up, is property management. So the license that we have, one of the benefits is we are property managers. So you have that ability, at least, and this might depend on some states, so maybe check if you're not watching in Illinois, but at least here, I'm allowed to operate as a property manager because I'm servicing in real estate needs. So I looked at that and thought, that's a great opportunity if I ever wanted to get into managing something like an Airbnb or a midterm rental. And really, the simple change was when I'm talking to clients and I'm asking what they need, I make sure they know that I offer property management solutions and they are aware that if they are looking to manage a short-term or a mid-term rental, whether it's here or anywhere else, that can be something I help them with and take care of. So those two have become passive streams of income for me over the last, like I said, 12 to 18 months. Awesome. I have a lot to unpack in that and just questions for you, just because on the property management side, have you systematized that to where it actually is passive income for you, where you're like, okay, here's my system. We're going to plug it in. You're going to come in. I'm going to take this over. Because if you have, that is awesome. Because that's something that I'm looking to do. That's Not the on the short-term part, rental right? side, but... That's truly the... If you're going to get into property management, the one caveat I'll give you is you might want to pick a local market to start because early on, it's a job. I mean, it, particularly if you're doing something like short-term management where you got to get furniture involved and... It's a job. You got to furnish a place yeah. and you have to be on site or you at least need to know somebody on site. So there is a certain level of upwork in the beginning to get it set up. But now that the property is running, the two that I'm thinking of that I managed to start are in Peoria, Illinois. It's about three hours from Chicago. So I'm not really dropping everything to get over to Peoria at any given time. But I have it set up to the point where if something went wrong and I needed dies on, somebody could get over there. We have the technicians in place. If something breaks, they needed a valve replaced on the washer today the technician's going over there, right? So you're setting up the network of people to manage everything as best you can. Once you have the right context in place, and once you leverage, I leverage a lot of tools and software, right? So I use like Hospitable for guest management, and I use AirDNA to help uh, kind of guide pricing on certain things. So 
If you're leveraging some of the tools that help decision making easier and you find contacts who can manage it for you, it can become relatively passive. It's not fully passive because I'm still engaged and I do commit some level of time to it, but it's way more passive than, you know, most property management would be if you were just doing it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I was just curious on that because it is something I'm actively looking at as a broker myself. I'm just like, okay, there's a business model there and I'm looking at multifamily 30 to 90 units sort of deal because there seems to be a pain point in that market. So the automation side of it, of getting that actually truly automated is appealing to me and providing like top level service. So really interesting as well. You were talking about your referral system that you have set up. So I agree. That's fantastic. If you are able to set that up and you're generating leads, because really in real estate, I would say if you don't think of yourself as like a marketing company, then you're not necessarily thinking of your company the right way, because that's really what we do. We're marketing for leads and converting leads, right? And so if you're able to get those leads into your funnel, into your system, and then yet you've created another system, it sounds like, to track your referral people. So a couple of questions came out of that in my mind. One, how are you determining what markets? Like, do you have in Chicago? I don't know if they're local people who are maybe moving out and you're acting almost like a relocation service. So are you, where are those leads coming from is one question. Mm -hmm. And then like, how do you determine what markets you want to find a referral partner in? Absolutely. Both great questions. So maybe backing up to the strategy side of it. When I was thinking of this whole concept, referral network and and handing out leads or bringing leads back, it kind of looked like a spider web in my mind. And I was thinking there's one of two ways you can go. You can either work from the center out or you can work from the out towards the center. So one approach would be to be the center that is throwing out the referrals. So for me, that would be collecting leads, getting clients who are going to search somewhere in the United States, doesn't matter where, to contact me at the center of the web. Once I have the information, I splinter out to go find what fits for them. The reverse of that would be target markets. Maybe you know that 90% of your relocation clients are going to Miami and Denver and Phoenix, right? And so then you find agents in those markets and you target them. You have the web already set up. So if anything comes in, you can go backward channel. You've already got it set up. That was where I was deciding on how I wanted to launch it physically as like a business model. I was trying to decide which would be easier for me to manage. And the way I decided in the beginning was the contacts I'm making with agents kind of develop naturally over time, but I wanted to let the clients guide me. So I started using, I call it like a dragnet strategy. Basically everything that I was making, whether my content directly talks about it or not, Like right now, if you go to one of my videos on YouTube and you just click down in the description, there's a link in there that says agent referral program. If you go to my Instagram, there's a link in there and it says agent referral program. So I've just made it omnipresent as in it's very easy to access. So if you happen to come across it in one of my newsletters online, in a piece of content that I put out there, when we're talking, I'll reference it and I'll just say, hey, if you ever do need this, just check it out. Hop on my website. You can find a link. All of that kind of feeds back the same way that when the decision point comes, which is I need to move, I'm just trying to catch them in that moment, right? If they fill it out and they get me involved, then you take on the grunt work of contacting the local markets. The reason I didn't go the other way in the beginning was because my fear, which has in some ways been validated, is I was afraid I would invest time maybe developing a relationship with an agent in Phoenix only to have a client call me and go, hey, I'm moving to Glendale. And that agent, I don't know how well you know Arizona, but it's not a good fit probably. So that was my concern is we're so hyper local in some places that I didn't want to miss the boat. You'd almost have to have like a direct landing page, move to Glendale. (laughs) That's all you're talking about. And I've actually seen other agents creatively do that where they'll be like, hey, all my clients who are moving to Scottsdale, if you need a referral, I'm partnering with this agent and they co-brand stuff and they put some money behind it. And I actually think that's a pretty good idea if you know that you have consistent lead flow going one or both ways, right? It just depends on how well you know the clients you're working with. If this is a dragnet approach and you don't care who you're talking to, it's anybody moving anywhere, that's what I'm describing, right? I'm just trying to get contacts from somebody who's going through the process, maybe wants a little guidance from somebody who's an expert, not in their market, but at the process itself. And that's where I insert myself. You know, I'm taking off the interview period for them. So you're not necessarily making a more luxury thing and focus on specific markets like Miami or maybe New York or whatever it might be. You could certainly do that. It would just look a little different. Yeah. But you're not targeting specifically Chicago residents 
looking nope. to move out of Chicago. You're just I've had you, conversations just with out, people like, in Boston, Tampa. Yeah, I've had yeah. some down in Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, it, it's really the power, I guess, behind social media, which I've always been an advocate for and will continue to advocate for. Is you're connecting with people that maybe wouldn't or even shouldn't interact with your content on any given day, but they do. And for one reason yeah. or another, if your value is there and they can interact and you give them a way to funnel, then you can get something out of that engagement. So that's yeah. where this lead system has paid off. What do you house that in? I'm just curious again, is that your typical CRM that you're using for all your other real estate business? Or is that just, you have that in a Google spreadsheet? Like, what are you doing? So the actual lead flow would be, they register first through Calendly. Calendly is where they fill out yeah base information, get the schedule on the books. You know, we get a time confirmed, all that good stuff. I then take the Calendly information that's synced to my CRM. So then they're put in for follow-up and continue campaigns. It's different than somebody who contacts me here in Chicago looking for real estate. I'm not going to spam them with listings, right? That's not why they called me. It, the follow-up is more, did you get what you needed? Did you actually yeah, yeah. connect with the agent? Did you have a good conversation? Are you up and running on your search? Do you need anything from me? So you're still staying engaged because I still consider my referrals my clients. I want to know that they're being taken care of. And maybe more so, I don't want to lose the lead. If they're not being taken care of and they just call somebody else, now you're out. So at all times, you want to stay just involved in the relationship. And I think that's where the CRM steps in, at least on this specific front, is just helping me stay touch point involved with clients as they go through it. Yeah, that's interesting. So yeah, that's cool. I haven't seen that as a model or haven't thought of it as a model, but as like a serious revenue driver where you're going out and using that as a specific marketing thing. So yeah, I'm sure anybody listening that can set that same process would benefit from having some extra income coming in for that work. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess on the brokerage side of the business, again, you mentioned something a second ago. I don't know if it was tracking, but it was I guess, what does your team look like? Are you solo agent? Do you have a team? Are you broker? Where are you in that hierarchy? Yeah. So the word broker is used in every state so differently. It cracks me up. But brokerage wise, Baird & Warner is the brokerage where I hang my license. I have a managing broker in my office, David Bailey. Awesome guy for anybody looking to get into Chicago real estate. And then I am a practicing real estate broker or real estate agent here in Chicago. So my team is really, I have internal operations team at Baird & Warner. So manages like contract care and things like that, touch points. There is a marketing arm that I leverage as well. But for agents to agent communication, I just tend to it, exactly what I'm talking about. I refer out, you know, if I need help on any given deal, I bring an agent in from my office, I cut them a referral check and have them help me. But I've chosen to run a model where I'm leaning away from mega team and bringing on a lot of headcount. Yeah, got it. So yeah, you're, would you say the majority of your business is just on standard transactions that you're doing locally, or are you getting the majority of your revenue from your referral business? The referral business, I started to make a focus, I'd say about nine months ago is when I really clicked it on. That was when I was like, this is going to become something I put and focused effort behind. I'm going to have links that guide everyone and start tracking. And that started to gain steam. So I think looking at 2023, if I'm just forecasting, I would guess that that will be 10 to 15% of my business will be the referrals probably that I'm making to other agents that are then filtering back to me. The rest of it will be transactions that I'm directly managing. Yeah, you got it. So I guess, again, on the content creation side of it, as agents, we are all out there trying to create content. I've got this podcast going. We've got like being front of mind and I guess in people's conscious all the time is very helpful in the business. So when you were going about creating that strategy and just when you think about content creation in general, do you try to drive everybody to a single source or how do you look at your content plan or your content you know, strategy? Everybody go to this thing. This is my referral business link. Or do you look at it as, you know, just email me, like text me. What are you trying to drive people to? Curious. I'm a strong believer in call to action on everything. So I do think add value, provide call to action, give people a reason to funnel to something and then be there when they land, right? That's sort of like marketing 101, if you will. So I don't choose to drive everybody to this. I sort of have pillars of my day-to-day marketing campaign. And this probably isn't unfamiliar to anybody who's like rolling out a lot of video content in particular, but I'm doing educational content. So just strictly about the process itself, answering common questions, what we've heard in the news, maybe soothing fears, just just educational talking head type content. There's obviously new listings. So for sale, coming soon, recently sold, testimonials, things like that. Anything that builds 
clout, repetition, just general trust and respect. Not overdone. I don't like to be a look at me type thing. I just like to provide value. But I do think that at some point you need to stand up and be like, hey, you know, I run a good business. Here's what it looks like. The other side of it, I do think is what I would consider the fun stuff. So the fun stuff for me is talking about coaching, my Airbnb passive income, my dog Murphy, the passive stuff in my life that brings me joy and in some ways brings me capital, but isn't directly tied to my day-to-day in real estate. So that always surfaces. And I tend to believe inspires conversations that come back to real estate. And then the last part of it is the directly, I'm asking you for the business. This is why you should call me, hire me, click this link, go here, whatever type of content. That's probably the least frequent. I don't like people being slammed with ads. I know that I am a salesman, marketing and sales. That's what we do professionally. I don't want it to be slamming you in the face with a hammer that I'm a salesman, right? I want every fourth or fifth post after we've engaged and you saw my dog and you saw me post a beautiful listing that you might click on. Then you see the agent referral link and you're like, oh yeah, okay. I trust Matt. I know Matt. I've seen his content. So there's always a call to action. There's always something driving people, but I'm really not a firm believer of just repeatedly calling the same call to action Unless you're the exception might be if you're driving like an event or one critical campaign for something or, you know, I try to avoid sounding redundant. Yeah, for sure. All right. You get in for the so appreciate you sharing those tips and some of the things that you're doing that are working for you. Let's talk a little bit about you either talk about the market or we can talk about investing. So let's talk about I guess what are you seeing up in the market right now on the real estate space? Are you guys having a I'll tell you some anecdotes from around the country. Rhode Island, seeing multiple offer situations still happening. I spoke to another agent and they are seeing that pricing isn't declining. It's going up slightly. And then other parts of the country going down just a little bit. So it's it's like kind of all over the map. I don't know what you guys are seeing right now in Chicago. Yeah. Whenever I'm having a real technical market conversation, we have to dive into asset classes because they're all performing differently. But just if we're summing Chicago up as a whole, we're not seeing holistic major price reductions right now because we don't have the inventory to support it. We're somewhere between one to three months inventory in most of the 77 neighborhoods in Chicago. So that's not a strong enough inventory to support any sort of strong negotiation for buyers. We need more people to sell their home before we're going to see drastic change. Multiple offers are present and it can be very difficult to find a home depending on what you're looking for. If you want single family home on the North Shore of Chicago, good luck. Uh, Hunt off market and hope you find a friend of a friend, right? If you want a condo in River North, which is downtown, you probably have pretty good odds. That's three months inventory, which feels heavy compared to every other neighborhood. You can find something, particularly if you do a little bit of work. So our market, I think right now is defined by frustrated buyers, people who want to buy, people who are waiting to buy. They're looking at every single thing that comes on market. It's just a matter of when it actually comes on market and hits for them. We're proud to be sponsored by Ridgeline Investment Group. Ridgeline has a track record of transacting more than $53 million in assets throughout Texas. Ridgeline is currently looking to acquire 100 to 200 unit Class B multifamily communities between 5 and $20 million in San Antonio, Temple, Waco, Tyler, and other Texas secondary markets. To learn more about Ridgeline Investment Group, visit www.ridgelineig.com. Yeah. So no reduction, I guess, in the number of buyers, mm-hmm. just reduction in the actual um, inventory, which is driving the buyers who are still in the market. So the interest rates really haven't deterred people, or these are just buyers that just need to buy like what's what do you It's a mix. Do I don't know that everybody needs to buy. The other side of this is Chicago rents went up over 20% year over year. I don't think it will continue to skyrocket like that, but I also don't think it's crashing down anytime soon. So you have these people who have renewal cycles sort of, I don't know if it's forcing them or if they're just trying to work around it. But either way, I would say the market is defined by people who are willing to sacrifice more than they would have a year and a half ago. So if we had 100 buyers who were looking in any given neighborhood, I don't think those buyers went anywhere. They're still hunting. They just shifted from being 750 buyers to 600. And now that 600 class who's priced out and feels the competition, they're at the 500 or 450. So everybody's feeling it and it's kind of working its way down the squeeze right now through the buyer chain. So I think, and I could be wrong, but I think from what we've seen in the number of mortgage applications, the number of offers being made, the inventory to compare it against, we have not seen a strong decline in the number of ready, willing, and able home buyers in Chicago. What we don't have is the number of homes necessary to fulfill that need 
And until we do, they're just continuing to sacrifice more and more and more and go down the chain, you know, and that's where they're ending up. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's very similar to what I've seen locally and in conversations with others from around the country. So, all right, well, let's talk about some investments. I'm just, again, curious, when we started talking, did you say that you have Airbnbs yourself or do you have short-term rental, long-term rentals? Like, what do you have your fingers in? Yeah. So I started my investment journey. I bought a condo in 2020 in the West Loop in Chicago. I lived in it. I renovated most of it myself, did the kitchen, did the bathroom, did some floors, and then I rented it out after living there for about 18 months. I bought another home here in Irving Park. That's what I'm sitting in now. And I rent out the basement here for Airbnb. I have a, an entry in law suite. So I've got a single room rental down there with a full bathroom. And then I also manage the duplex in Peoria. So I have the top floor is a two bed, two bath. The bottom floor is a three bed, two bath. Both of them are midterm rentals, nothing under 30 days. We tend to focus on like the 30 to 90 day mark traveling nurses, traveling sales reps, we've had a few students here and there, or even recently we had somebody who was put out for a fire or an emergency. Uh, so we were happy to help them. Yeah. But at this point, my we're full sort of very local as in, in my basement and around the corner. And then I have some a couple hours away. Yeah. How do you find the house hacking deal where you've got somebody living below you, everything working out all right? Do you ever have any issues with them, you know, knocking on your door at random hours, or is it a friend, you know, like, what does that look like? The better you set it up, the better it's going to be. Yes, you will get the inevitable knocks. It's when things break or when you run out of something, right? Like, hey, I can't find the toilet paper or hey, I can't find the cleaning solution, right? So the better stocked you are, the better prepared you are, the more you avoid the questions, the less likely that is to happen. But some of it is truly, I didn't get a degree in this, but I feel like a lot of my life is just user experience, right? And the better you set it up so that people come and have a nice experience without needing to engage with you, the more likely you are to not hear from them. So it's answering every question you can think of before they actually get there. Yeah, it's like any kind of revenue stream. If you can systematize everything, then it makes it a little bit easier. Totally, yeah. yourself from it. And you don't want to be cold. Uh, I don't want them to get the vibe that we can't communicate, but it's, you know, (laughs) I'm just not inviting them in my living room. Yeah, so how long were you in real estate before you invested or was it you bought something and then you got into real estate? Like, how did that process work out? Oh, I messed that one up. They, it, one thing they don't tell you when you're thinking about going into real estate is that it really will hurt you when you go to buy a home. So I was in corporate America. I was making comfortable six figures. That was end of 2017. I went into real estate in 2018. And then I decided, oh, I'll try to go buy a house. And the lender did not like the gap in income there or the change in circumstances. So I had to wait a little bit. It took me about 12 to 18 months before I could prove I had consistent income and was actually showing growth and I wasn't transitioning jobs anymore. And then I invested. So actually looking back, I probably would have bought before I left my corporate job and then jumped in. Would have been a little bit smarter to do that way. But ultimately, I got along the same way. I had a conversation. It may have been an episode that aired just recently. And the agent's super young. And he was like, well, I couldn't invest yet because I hadn't done my taxes. And it just doesn't dawn on you, right? You don't think about it. Back in the day when I got into investing and buying, that was certainly a problem. But after doing it for so long, you just don't think about how that's a challenge for real estate agents (laughs) to go early in their career to go and actually buy something. And I hadn't even, I knew I wanted to use the license to do it. I saw the long-term vision, but I didn't even think of the short-term stumbling block. It was just like, oh, once it was so obvious once I walked in and thought about it. But yeah, so certainly agents be warned if you're going to buy something, maybe do it and then go in full-time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So how, what was the transition? Like, why did you get out of corporate and go into real estate? What was the... I worked for a great company. I worked for NetApp. I was a Fortune 500 company. I sold data storage. I worked with some amazing people who I stay in touch with to this day. And I think I learned more than anything solution-based sales. I know that they spent tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands on educating us how to do that the right way in major enterprise class deployments. So bringing that back, I didn't fall out of love with the company. I fell out of love with B2B sales. It was truly... I would spend hours and lots of corporate dollars on whining and dining executives for them to nickel and dime me or just choose not to go with my technology because they won't lose their job renewing with the same service they've had for 10 years. So it was a very frustrating sales cycle. I didn't feel like I was making real lasting connections, felt like a lot of them were surface level. And that was 
eventually came to a head for me. You know, I just felt so unfulfilled in the day-to-day operations. It was like, where can I deploy the same skill set, which I know I'm good at, in something that will actually be fulfilling and enjoying? And that was where real estate stepped in. I grew up in a real estate household. My mom's done it for 30 years. I knew exactly what I was getting into, good, bad, or ugly. So it wasn't a difficult decision to figure out where I wanted to go. It was a difficult decision to decide to leave and to just go full time. Just, I mean, just purely from a financial standpoint, you're looking at the fact that you're giving up your health care and you're giving up your retirement plan and you have to now go hunt what you eat. And it's a very different world than the corporate world for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I started the podcast again was to help agents and get to the point to where you can have a retirement account set up, how you can invest and have some long-term deal because we don't have that, right? I don't know of any brokerage that offers 401k matching. Maybe there are a few, but I don't know if you're- Yeah, none to my knowledge. You're right. I mean, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. And so it really is the, exactly like you said, you hunt, would you kill? If you don't have another transaction in the pipeline, then you're not making money. And so, yeah, that's why, again, setting up some sort of passive income and setting up investments that are paying you when you are not working is so important. And everybody listening needs to start investing. You know, you have to turn the switch on. So when you first went and bought your first place, do you remember, was it scary or you just knew real estate so much from your mom doing it and being in that household that you're like, I know this is, I know what I'm buying. I know what I'm getting into. It's going to be, we got this. I got this. You know, the only part that was scary to me is I was the first person in my family, I think, to own a condo, which was, that sounds crazy, but we just never lived anywhere where there were condos, you know, so everyone had homes. And that was a different element to understand that there was a board and they could pass things like a special assessment. I might have to pay that. And thankfully, I had the real estate education to help me. And I knew what I was getting into from going through deals before I actually bought mine. I was a difficult client, for sure. Finding my place took a while because you're just so meticulous, I guess. I look at so many homes in the day. So I knew what I wanted. I knew what opportunity I was seeking to fulfill. I knew what it was going to serve long-term. It was just a timing game, finding it. And then, you know, finding yeah. someone who would negotiate where I wanted to go. But I actually think I took a lot of confidence coming into it because I was an agent. You know, I knew going into that negotiation, I know I can negotiate. So I'm just negotiating for myself, which was sort of fun. Yeah. Do you find negotiating for yourself sometimes is a double-edged sword? I don't know how much, because I bought a lot of houses, right? And on the brokerage side. So recently I used another broker to sell something and I found that I could just be very stern and didn't have, because when I'm negotiating, sometimes I develop a relationship with the other agent Mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there talking and I'm like, yeah, okay, let's just get the deal done. And so it turns into... Maybe I'm negotiating with myself. So I don't know. Have you ever come across that or you just... You, For sure. You... I have actually. Where <laughs> I, and when I... There was a while where I wanted to invest and I still want to invest out of state. And I was looking in South Bend, Indiana because I'm a Notre Dame grad. And I thought, great, I could buy a property here and have short-term rental. And at first I was thinking, okay, I'll get my Indiana license and I'll do it myself. And... I just, after I thought about it for more than five seconds, I came to the conclusion, which is what you just said. I was like, there's no way I'm going to be impartial through this process, even in the sense that I'll be annoyed. I got to drive an hour and a half back and forth to get to do things. I'm going to be pissed when we're negotiating because of the physical element of it. So there was this whole side of it. There is logic to say, all right, as long as you trust who you're dealing with and you still have power to say and do what you need to do, it does help to have a second party in the room. You know, you're not exactly behaving how you should be. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the power of having... So again, in my prior life, like recently, all of our marketing that we were doing was all generating the leads are coming in and then we're negotiating the deals direct. Mm -hmm. And so what we found when we were doing marketing, we're bringing everything in-house, right? You're spending a ton of money. Like We would spend so much money marketing to try to get a lead. And what I found was that if we would just use brokers to find deals, then it was a much easier process, right? It costs us a lot less money. We may pay some in commissions to get them to bring us deals, but it's so much less costly. It's the same thing with wholesalers. I don't know if you're familiar with wholesales, Mm -hmm. but wholesalers are investors. They go out and that's kind of what we were doing. We would invest a ton of money on marketing and then we would sell those deals to someone else. And so what I found later in my career after doing that for a long time was if we simply go to other wholesalers and get them to send us deals, it was a lot easier, right? We didn't have to spend Yeah. If they know the deal, right? Let them do the legwork. Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing when you're looking out of state or looking in those other markets, if you could leverage 
what that broker is currently doing, yeah, you're going to save yourself a lot of time and headache and hassle. I, I tend to believe, to and I don't want to oversimplify our industry, but not a lot of what any of us do. It can be very lucrative. And if you have a right process around it, they really have a great life using real estate as a tool, but none of it's brain surgery, right? It's not overly difficult. And if you find somebody in a market who's competent and knows what they're doing and has worked there for a while in particular, that's a really valuable asset. So for me, it always boils down to, do I want to spend the time it would take to learn as much as they know and can offer and can, you know, and add perspective to the situation? Or do I want to just use them and leverage the the connection? And I think yeah. so often in my business, I come back to just leverage the connection. Like, why do you need yeah. to go become an expert of X, Y, Z? I agree hundred percent and moving into, so getting out of the single family world, moving into the multifamily world, I could do the same. I could go out and try to find every single deal there is, or I could just leverage broker relationships. And that's the way to go because they're spending the money. They're negotiating the deals or getting it up. Right. Front, and then I can just cherry. And they're always going to be more in it than you are, right? Like you're yeah. always battling and trying to pay to get in. They're just in it. They live in it. So yeah. it's just a different yeah. perspective. Yeah. So Good. I'm glad we got there. Sorry about that. No, it's, it happens <laughs> to the best of us. <laughs> All right. So look, we're 38 minutes past. I guess on the investing side, have you, because one of the things that I'm doing now is syndications and funds and that sort of thing. So not sure how familiar you are with those and how those operate and how they work, but do you get any deal flow? Do you ever look at apartments to purchase? Do you ever look at storage or any other asset classes that maybe a syndicator is bringing to you and you can invest in? So backing up, I mean, I'm a believer, particularly just crowdsource investing in general, right? So like when I see these companies like Fundrise or anything where you can take a partial investment in some sort of real estate asset, I think that's a hugely valuable thing that people overlook, particularly if they want to become investors and they don't have a lot of capital. It's a great way to get introduced to it. Here, I don't particularly run any syndication myself. I'm not involved with any directly. What I will say is when I have clients coming with specific needs, we tend to match them with the right opportunity. So we have enough investors who come to Chicago who say, yeah, I want to buy a multi-unit because I'm going to stand it up for short-term rental. And oh, by the way, I'm also investing in a large multi-unit investment, multi-family investment. I'm looking for apartments, 100 to 200 doors. This is the level of rehab I want to do. So you have investors who kind of cross both spectrums. And when needed, I know who to call here locally to get it done. But we don't have... a um, I'm not personally tied to anything that's driving apartment investments. Yeah. That sounds like you're really good at relationships and, you know, you're a connector is what it sounds like. For you're sure. I think that's a lot of this job yeah. is, you know, I don't need to be the guy, but I can be your one step connection to the guy. And I think that that has yeah. a lot of value on its own. Yeah. So again, on the syndication side and on the fun side, as a real estate professional, I would say if you spent a little bit of time just maybe looking in your market or looking or talking to other guys, other operators who are buying and taking down those sort of things. And I mean, you can get on the fundraised sort of sites and that sort of thing and look at some of these investments. But as real estate professionals, it's really beneficial for us, especially right now. There's still, I think it's 80% bonus depreciation is still able to be taken as real estate professionals when you invest wow. in these types of assets. So. When you buy something, I talk about this all the time, but when you buy something and say you invest $100,000 into a large uh, apartment deal, you can typically get 50 to 60% of that. I'd have to look at how it is now because it used to be 100% bonus depreciation, but it's gone down. It's going to scale out or phase out, but you can get that as a tax write-off in year one when you put that money to work. And so- we earn a lot of active income as agents. We're always going out. We close a deal. We get paid. And if you take some of that money and you put it into an investment like that, the tax benefits are just one reason to invest in those deals. Obviously, long-term wealth creation is one. You got income from the actual property that's spitting off distributions. So yeah, again, if you haven't looked at them, then I would recommend or say, you know, start educating yourself on that type of investment so that when you're ready, if you ever get ready, or if it is appealing to you, that you're familiar with it so that you can execute on one because it would help offset. Yeah, your, I think uh, it's extremely uh, valuable, you know, and where I've seen yeah. it, actually, a mentor of mine on the Airbnb space has scaled from managing 
single units to multi units to multifamily to now managing boutique hotels. And the process of that was just very similar, right? The benefits and tax write offs of purchasing these large scale commercial assets and going through just a leveling up of his business. So, yeah, I appreciate the tip because that for me seems like the next natural evolution, particularly for somebody who's, you know, invested already. Yeah. Yeah. And you're active, you're in it. I mean, it is a next step. So, but let me ask you three questions before we jump off. Typically, you know, just like to end with these things. So I guess let me ask this first, because I'm always curious, what advice would you give a real estate agent who has maybe got into real estate because they wanted to own some of the assets, but they haven't actually started investing yet? You know, like what would you give them? What kind of advice would you give them? If you're a new agent and you're looking to get into investing, I really think you almost need to start with the very basic plan of what need that investment is going to serve. I think too often people, and this isn't just real estate agents, but just investors, novice investors come into this and it's an overwhelming amount of information for how you can buy an asset and leverage it out. Pick a path, right? Or maybe at least pick a couple paths to understand and then focus on that. I think if you spin your wheels too much on, oh, I could house hack or, oh, I could buy a condo and do a 12-month lease or, oh, I could do Airbnb, you're not going to do anything. And that's where most people get stuck is in this crazy information cycle forever. So I would focus on one or two plans. And the only reason to have two would be a backup. If you think that you're going to do a long-term rental somewhere and realize the numbers look better for short-term, that's a pretty good backup, right? So if you understand both routes, you can use them together. But if you refine from there and you know, okay, my goal is short-term rental or my goal is regular 12-month lease, then you can focus your search in a much different way because the way that you should be approaching investments is just running numbers, running numbers, running numbers, and making offers based on those numbers. But that doesn't start until you know what you're offering on, and it doesn't start until you know what numbers you need to hit. So again, like that critical first element, not just for real estate agents, but anybody in the investing journey is figure out what it is this actually serves in your life. What are your objectives, your clear-cut financial objectives for that investment, and then backtrack into the asset class and the approach for that. 100%. I agree with that. Yeah. The way you said it first, I was going to add, yeah, you definitely want to know why you're going to buy it or what you're going to buy, knowing your own goals. So yeah, you said that. Well said. We do this thing early on in the show where I put out like the five things to get you started investing. The first one's like goals. You go figure out what you're trying to do, you know, your family, uh, your lifestyle, like what are you trying to do? And then you can pick a bunch of different paths from knowing that, but you can't even pick one path until you know that. So And Um, I think some people stop short, like they figure out the goal is I want to make 3000 a month in passive income. And they kind of end there. It's like, all right, you haven't figured out the how, the where, the why there's got to be a lot more involved in your goal. You really need to have it fleshed out fully. And then you go to play and, you know, and too often people are like, well, I want passive income or I want this much money, but they don't have the rest of it. You know, goal setting is huge. Yeah, for sure. All right. Awesome advice. Thanks for that. All right. So then let's wrap it up. I've got a couple of questions that I'll ask. What is your favorite pastime not related to business? Ooh, favorite pastime not related to business. Let me think about this. This just said anywhere in the family, anywhere in life, Anything. any pastime yeah. at all. What do you like to do that's not related to business? Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing that is now becoming a family thing to do. And one thing I'm about to get my girlfriend to do is I'm a big scuba diver. I truly right. love being underwater, it's something my mom was the first to get licensed. And then we found out that actually her dad was in the Navy and he learned to do diving there. And so now we've got like this whole multi-generation of divers we didn't even know about. But I think it's pretty cool to put yourself in what is an obvious, uncomfortable situation and to just come to peace with it. You're in an element that you don't control. You have to learn how to survive on a very basic level. But at some point you start enjoying it and it's a freeing experience unlike most anything else I've experienced. So that's something that I think I'll teach my kids, something I'm going to get my girlfriend to do. It's I love it. Scuba is is great. You have a favorite spot? Tough. I would say that where I've been and seen the most wildlife was probably Belize. Belize and there's a reef off of Belize which is second only to the Great Barrier Reef in size and in scale of wildlife and so that was where It was like swimming in an aquarium, you know, sharks, turtles, eels, you name it. They were all over the place where you can go and probably have some of the best diving in the world is anywhere in the Caribbean, though. I mean, you can go if you go get in the water in Nassau in the Bahamas, I think you can see for like a mile underwater just because the water is so clear. 
Yeah, it's so blue there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's unbelievable. Both. Yeah, I didn't scuba dive in either. I've only been once. And I will tell you, yes, learning how to survive. I go under and I'm like, <laughs> and I see the, the instructors <laughs> like single tiny string of bubbles going up. And he's like, you need to chill. Blue? You need to chill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you learn Blue. for a long time, scuba, I had this false sense of confidence. And then unfortunately I had an incident where my reg stopped working and I was out of air underwater at 60 feet. And when you go through something like that, you learn a lot about yourself, but you also learn just to be calm. Like that is a moment where... I could have died. I didn't, thankfully, I'm here. But it was something where everybody was calm. We got through the training. I remember what they had taught me. We got to the surface safely and everything was okay. And so I think that it's interesting to go through a life experience and scuba gave it to me where things can go wrong and it was still okay and I'm still going to get back in the water, but things happen. Yeah, that would be intense, but yes. <laughs> Good for the training. Got you through. Right. All right. Let's see. What's the best thing or memory that's happened to you, your family in the like last 60 days or so? Ooh, in the last 60 days. Okay. Well, I, actually, so in the last 60 days, my dad had a birthday. <laughs> so my dad, he's getting, I'm not going to throw his age out there because he won't like it. But my dad now <laughs> has retired several times in life. I've always appreciated that every time I talk to him, he likes to pretend that this is finally the end and he's going to retire and oh, he's getting sore and oh, time is going by. And yeah, he'll be working for another five to 10 years. I have no <laughs> doubt. So dad, I love you. It was fun celebrating your birthday, but you're not retiring anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, I got a job for you. <laughs> yeah. um, then name one or two people who've been most influential to your success or the way you think. Absolutely. The one is family and it comes to name right away. Tom Mendoza um, is my uncle. Tom has been on the board of many successful companies. He was on the rise of NetApp when it went through its rise to become a Fortune 500 company. And really at the core of how Tom made his life and how he's taught me to run my business is that People don't care what you know unless they know that you care. And it's a very person-to-person, relation-focused type of life. And I really took that to heart early on. And he's been a mentor since I was a little kid on now. I still talk to Tom all the time about different things happening in my career, my business world, even financial advice. So it's really been a blessing to have Tom in my corner, truly. I would say on the other side of things, I have one of the best managing brokers in Chicago. David Bailey at Baird & Warner Lincoln Park is one of the most knowledgeable individuals I've had the pleasure of working alongside. He never forces anybody to do something in their business that they don't want to, but he will always encourage you to take uncomfortable steps for growth. And I think that the result is we have an office culture that is competitive in all the right ways. We have a lot of young, hungry talent who's just trying to get better and celebrating those that are getting better alongside them. And it's been cool. It's been a really fun and enjoyable experience to be a part of what feels like a growing company, right? It's this expanding brokerage of agents who are young, hungry, and motivated to do the job the right way. And David is the one who inspired that. Awesome. All right. We're going to put your uh, contact information down in the show notes, but Matt, it's been awesome catching up with you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, some tips that other agents can use and implement in their business to succeed. And it was great getting to know you a bit more here on the show. So thanks, guys. I appreciate the time. Thank you for having me. And now, I mean, my literal next step when we hang up is I'm going to go research apartment syndication in Chicago. There you go. (laughs) Let me know if you want to talk more about it. (laughs) Absolutely. All right, guys. Catch you on the next episode. Surprisingly, most of the agents we speak with got into real estate hoping to gain passive income and become work optional. However, only one in five ever start investing. Most are simply too afraid to start. Once you get educated by listening to this show, you'll be able to overcome that fear and become the one in five who are finding financial freedom. Don't miss a single episode. If you want to stay up to date, the best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. And we'll catch you on the next episode.